So the first topic that we look at in the Cold War course, the different factors that led to the emergence of the Cold War in the years up to 1955. Now, in terms of a definition, one way of describing the Cold War would be the period of tension that began after the end of the Second World War in 1945 and lasted up until 1989. And it was between the Soviet Union and the United States. The reason it's called the Cold War is mainly because there is never any direct fighting between Soviet Union and the United States. From the SQA's point of view, they have identified five factors that we need to be aware of when we're looking at what caused the Cold War to emerge in the decade after the Second World War. And what we're going to be looking at now are the first two. So we'll be looking at ideological differences, but also tensions within the wartime alliance. And again, just so we've got an understanding of the differences in beliefs or ideologies. The United States would describe itself as being a democracy, whereas the Soviet Union was communist. Now, one way of defining difference between the two would be looking at politics. In America, we have multi-party elections, whereas in the Soviet Union and other subsequent communist states, they would have elections, but the only party you could elect candidates from was the Communist Party itself. Another way of looking at differences between the two would be on the grounds of economics. In the United States, you'd have a free market economy where um, entrepreneurship was encouraged and people would own their own business and they could generate as much wealth as they wanted. Whereas in a communist state, all uh, property or business was owned by the state itself. Profits were divided up equally between the people. Now, if we're looking at the Soviet Union, the first individual we need to be aware of is Lenin. Lenin was the leader of the Bolshevik party and he and his party seized power in October 1917. And right from the start, Lenin made it clear that he didn't think democracy and communism could exist side by side. And he did have plans from the beginning to spread communism throughout the world. He, he very much thought there would be a worldwide workers' revolution, which had begun in Russia, but then would spread through Europe and then throughout the rest of the world. Unsurprisingly, um, the Bolsheviks having seized power in October 1917 were faced with a good deal of opposition from within their own country. And a very bloody civil war existed between 1918 and 1921. The Bolsheviks were victorious, but the important thing for our course is to be aware of the fact that in the, between 1918 and 1920, various Western powers uh, sent their forces to Russia to aid the enemies of the Bolsheviks, so-called whites, in their attempts to overthrow uh, Lenin and his forces. And when we're talking about different powers, we're talking about the British, the United States, the French and the Japanese. Now, the result of foreign intervention in the Russian Civil War was a long-standing distrust between the Russians and the democratic West. Now, from this point forward, we're not going to talk about Russia anymore. We're going to refer to the Soviet Union. This was a name um, that the Bolsheviks took on, the communists took on to describe the region that they would control. You see in the center, we have uh, Russia itself, but the Soviet Union included a, a number of other republics around it, such as Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania over in the west and the so-called stands in the east. The USSR stands for the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Just on the eve of the Second World War, Stalin, leader of the Soviet Union, just indicate him here on the left, made a deal with Adolf Hitler, the so-called Nazi Soviet or Molotov-Ribbentrop Molotov Pact. Now to the, the whole world, they promised 10 years worth of friendship. What they designed, what they agreed to do in secret was a joint attack on Poland. 
And again, this helped uh, the Cold War to emerge because it led to massive distrust between uh, the West and the Soviet Union. As you're probably aware, in June 1941, Hitler uh, went and double-crossed his ally Stalin and invaded the Soviet Union in Operation Barbarossa. And it was at this stage that the Soviets went into an alliance with the British and the Americans and other um, enemies of Germany and fascist Japan, the so-called Grand Alliance. However, uh, despite uh, the promises of friendship, tensions did emerge and did develop, especially uh, because Stalin believed that the West were deliberately delaying launching any attack against Nazi-occupied Europe in the West, the so-called Second Front. His country, uh, for much of the war, in fact, all the way up until June 1944, was having to take on the brunt of the fight against uh, Nazi Germany. Okay. And we can see the so-called Grand Alliance image here. This is a uh, Soviet piece of propaganda. Very clearly, we can see a Red Army soldier uh, stood in alliance um, with the British and the Americans, and their aim was the death and destruction of Nazi Germany and the eventual capture of Berlin. Now, as I mentioned, there were tensions. As the Red Army began to push the the Nazis and their allies further west out of the Soviet Union and then into countries that had been occupied by Germans such as Poland, what the Nazis uh, left in the wake was a power vacuum. If we look at Poland, just as a single example, for all the time that their country was occupied from 1939 through to 1944, there was a, a government in exile based in London, and their aim was to re-establish some semblance of democracy within Poland. However, when the Red Army um, secured Poland in early 1945, they established a communist regime in Poland. Again, this has furthered distrust and tension uh, between America and the Soviet Union. In February 1945, the president of the United States, Franklin D. Roosevelt, died. However, it wasn't before in the same month that he had a meeting in Yalta, it's in the Crimea, in the modern day country of Ukraine, with Winston Churchill, who you can see seated on the left, and Joseph Stalin on the right. Now, the significance of the Yalta conference was twofold. First of all, they decided that post war Germany would be temporarily divided, and within Germany, uh, the uh, Western powers, Britain, France, and America, the West, and the Red Army, the Soviets in the East, would divide Germany, but also the capital city of Berlin, which was go going to be well inside the Eastern Red Army occupied zone of Germany. The other thing that was agreed at the um, conference was that after the war, they'd have a so-called United Nations, a peacekeeping organization. Now, the significance of this is that uh, there were five members of the so-called UN Security Council, Britain, France, China, the Soviet Union, and the United States. And the importance of, of these five uh, powers was that they'd be able to decide if and when the United Nations would be able to send in peacekeeping forces into a country in an attempt to bring about peace. Now, as I said, uh, Roosevelt died. He died of natural causes. And as per the American Constitution, his um, vice president, President Truman, stepped up to be the new president. And he'll be the man we're concentrating on for the foreseeable future. After Germany had been defeated, there was a second Great Powers Conference in July 1945. This was held in the German city of Potsdam. Now, in this photo here, we see what's technically the ex-British Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, President Truman, and Joseph Stalin, all seemingly good friends. However, the reality was this distrust 
still existed between the two. Now, said that uh, Churchill was the ex-Prime Minister. He, he lost the election. He was leader of the Conservatives. And Clement Attlee, against all expectations, won a landslide majority. So here we see the British Prime Minister alongside the political leaders of the two other great powers. Now, the importance of this conference, amongst other things, was that a declaration was issued in July 1945 to the Japanese calling for their prompt unconditional surrender or to face utter destruction. However, we'll learn about the consequences of the Japanese refusal to surrender in our next mini video. So I hope this has given you a good oversight of two of the five factors that led to the emergence of the Cold War.